Thank you very much, uh, Kohei, for the uh, kind introduction. It's my uh, great pleasure to uh, uh, come again to KU University and to celebrate our uh, long-standing collaboration between KU University and my home university, the uh, Technische Universität in München. Uh, this is a uh, at least from my point of view, scientifically and personally, a very, very productive uh, collaboration, I think, which extends at least uh, for the last 10 years or so. Uh, we are always very happy to have your excellent uh, researchers and uh, students come to visit us. Uh, most importantly, in my group, uh, recently, Eri uh, was with us and uh, Christoph for a couple of weeks. And I'm very, very uh, thankful for your kind hospitality in taking care of our uh, German students in particular, certainly Isabel and uh, uh, David. Um, the uh, joint uh, work scientifically uh, addresses uh, uh, spintronics, and that's the uh, main topic of uh, today's uh, colloquium. However, uh, since you were so kind and asked uh, David uh, to uh, present uh, the uh, results of uh, his thesis, which uh, was a collaboration with uh, your group. I thought that uh, I might uh, give you a flavor of the uh, other research topic that I'm following in my group right now, which quite frankly has nothing to do with uh, spintronics. Uh, and uh, it deals with uh, thermoelectrics in a rather conventional sense. So there's no spin calorietronics involved, which is a uh, very new and top topic, uh, trying to measure the analogous uh, effect of the Seebeck uh, effect with uh, spins, the so-called spin Seebeck effect. So what I'll be uh, discussing uh, in the la next uh, 30 minutes or so is a, a project uh, also funded by the uh, German uh, Research Foundation, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, in a collaborative research uh, project uh, on uh, nanostructured thermoelectrics. And the uh, key person in my group uh, working on this is uh, Benedikt Stoib, a, a PhD student who is uh, supported by two colleagues of uh, David, Anton Greppmeier and Simon Filzer, who are both uh, in the process of writing up their diploma and master uh, theses. And uh, I try to interfere as little as possible with them. Um, the uh, motivation behind this uh, to a certain extent goes uh, back to this seminal book by Joffe on uh, semiconductor thermoelectrics which I think uh, summarizes the main aim of uh, thermoelectrics very nicely. Uh, you have a source of heat, which in this particular case is a gas or kerosene burner. Then you have a device up here, which does not contain any moving part, but still converts the heat, or rather the temperature difference between uh, uh, the, uh, this reservoir down here and the second reservoir up here, or rather around this radiator. Uh, and it, it uses this temperature difference to generate electricity, which obviously drives this, uh, this uh, radio uh, receiver. More uh, importantly, uh, this approach has been used uh, in particular in the Soviet Union to power uh, telecommunications in very remote areas. Uh, and uh, uh, more recently, there's a big uh, discussion of whether it would make sense to uh, use the same uh, physics and uh, device uh, uh, setups that allow to make use of waste heat in a car. Uh, fortunately, certainly, this uh, particular one comes from, uh, from Munich. Uh, it makes use of this waste heat to generate a little bit of uh, additional electricity. Um, and uh, in fact, we are all, um, I would say, very impressed by uh, applications of this kind which are in space. Uh, this is a typical so-called radio, radio isotype thermoelectric generator where heat is generated via a radioactive uh, decay in uh, plutonium with a typical uh, half-life of a little less than 100 years. Uh, and you place this uh, red-hot 
uh, plutonium inside such a uh, thermoelectric generator. There are again these radiators that uh, radiate the heat and basically again lead to a temperature difference between in here and the outside uh, medium interstellar uh, gas, uh, interstellar medium. And then in between here there are these thermoelectric generators and uh, already here there's the uh, uh, particular um, element or the two elements that are mostly uh, used for this for these applications, namely silicon and germanium. And there's the big overlap, at least from my point of view, between the uh, spintronics and other more down to earth or maybe up in the heaven applications of, uh, of uh, these uh, semiconductor materials. There is a small list of uh, different uh, spacecraft which uh, 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 carry uh, such a radio, a radio isotope thermoelectric generator and also the uh, not so small rover that the Americans placed uh, on Mars about a year ago. Uh, this particular one is uh, to my understanding also operated by a um, electrical energy source like this. Uh, so, uh, let me say this is kind of a high-end application. There are certainly low-end applications. I think we have all witnessed the situation where one of our mobile devices hasn't worked and one uh, possible application for thermoelectrics uh, is uh, in this uh, um, advertisement photo by a, uh, a carrier in the United Kingdom. Uh, where you can use uh, the temperature difference between the heat in your uh, muscles and the outside temperature, which uh, in the UK can be uh, pretty low. So this temperature difference in such a Wellington boot to power your uh, uh, telephone. Uh, this is a magnification of the same. Uh, thing and you uh, not only uh, can use this approach uh, when um, walking in the woods but also when uh, doing your uh, workout and generate your uh, heat uh, in such a way but in fact the, uh, the piece of uh, your and my body which in fact uses the most energy uh, is also the one that uh, can in fact be used for uh, thermoelectric uh, uh, thermoelectrics. Uh, I'm not so sure whether it really looks well, uh, but this would be the, uh, the dream of uh, IMAC in Belgium to uh, in fact make use of the uh, heat generated by your and my brain and also the brain of this uh, young lady. Uh, and the uh, last application, and then I will come to uh, physics, is uh, this. Uh, um, and this is far uh, um, this is really a yeah, pre-commercial product uh, developed by uh, Philips in uh, um, the Netherlands where they uh, have these uh, thermoelectric generators placed down here. They make use of the difference in the uh, temperature of the uh, fire up here and the cool air coming in and they actually use this uh, additional uh, energy uh, generated to power a fan over here which brings in uh, fresh air and improves the fire which is uh, burning in this burner. And the result of this is that uh, the fire is a lot cleaner and does not generate as much soot as it would generate without the additional uh, um, air being brought in by this fan. And that apparently, uh, at least this is uh, how uh, CNN money describes this, is a, a very big benefit for uh, interpersonal relations in, uh, in countries where open fires are still uh, used because you don't make the uh, air of the neighbors uh, bad. Okay, after this uh, lengthy introduction, let me uh, uh, summarize for you a uh, thermoelectric generator. Uh, these are uh, devices such as this. Uh, you have, as I said, two heat baths. Uh, one uh, from which you take heat, uh, which is, a, uh, and you absorb it. Basically, uh, it's transported, not actively, but passively through this device. There's uh, the cold uh, heat uh, bath, 
where, which takes the uh, heat uh, coming from the hot bath and there is an, uh, uh, a certain amount of uh, electronic uh, material in between. And in particular, when you look at the uh, current density, electronic current density, which is certainly driven by a, a gradient in the electrostatic potential with a proportionality constant of the conductivity. And uh, we can, uh, with a gradient in temperature and the Seebeck coefficient, generate a similar potential difference which again via the usage of the conductivity can be uh, can drive an electric uh, current and where does this uh, potential difference uh, come from well this is a sketch of a, a very uh, simplified band diagram of a semiconductor with the conduction band minimum uh, the valence band maximum a certain uh, fermi level uh, indicated here in the um, 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 as an n-type semiconductor, so it's above the middle of the band gap. And this end of the semiconductor is hot, this end of the semiconductor is cold, and therefore I have two uh, Fermi distributions, a broader Fermi distribution over here, a more narrow Fermi distribution over on the cold end side, and the result is that I have more electrons firmly activated in the hot end part of the semiconductor rather than on the cold end part. And since I now have a difference in the concentration of electrons, there will be a diffusion going on. So I will have additional electrons, non, not uh, according to the uh, thermal statistics of the cold end, additional electrons over here which will lead to uh, local uh, space charges and therefore to the additional electrical field. And this electrical field then goes in here and we have a current. Similarly, you can plot this for a P-type semiconductor. And then uh, if we look again into the, this particular device, uh, these consist out of N-type legs and p-type legs. Uh, in both cases, as indicated here, there is a uh, flow of electrons from the, uh, of charge carriers from the hot end to the cold end. In the case of the uh, uh, n-type semiconductor, uh, as one leg, therefore I have the flow of electrons in this way. And then on this side, I have the analogous uh, process a flow of charge carriers from the hot to the cold side and in the p-type uh, material this is certainly then a flow of uh, holes in this uh, sense and therefore to have a current continuously flowing through the whole device this way I need to um, uh, build these different legs in uh, series such that I have a comparatively complicated uh, electrical uh, short circuiting basically between this hot leg end here and this hot leg end on the, uh, on the P and on the N type semiconductor. This uh, in particular is a, an, um, a problem in realizing such devices because uh, you do have to basically solder this uh, material and this material to an electrical conductor uh, and the soldering has to survive a lot of, uh, of heat cycles over here. So uh, some very, very interesting materials physics is involved here. To actually manufacture something like this, you therefore need a, uh, a substrate, you need the electrodes uh, on the substrate, you need these pellets that uh, represent the N and P type legs. You have to solder everything together and the result is such a module with a substrate for the uh, hot end and a substrate for the cold end side. Um, one uh, modern approach to reduce the um, difficulties in fabricating such devices comes from the company Micropelt. 
Uh, there they use a uh, basically um, a, a, a monocrystalline uh, silicon or silicon germanium uh, samples which they uh, structure, pre-structure in a certain way so that you have all these n-type and p-type um, legs uh, together on, a, on one single carrier and then basically with a kind of a uh, flip chip approach you bring these together and make this um, um, total um, device. Thermoelectric sounds fantastic but there is an inconvenient truth to borrow this uh, uh, title and this inconvenient truth is that the total efficiency of such a device is given uh, by the Carnot efficiency, so this is concerning that, that in fact this whole process that I've described to you is, in, is indeed limited by the Carnot efficiency, but then you can go through some uh, comparatively simple uh, statistics and find out that there is a second factor in here which reduces the um, uh, total efficiency that you can have with respect to the Carnot efficiency. And you can plot this uh, by a, um, in this uh, diagram here, assuming that the cold end of the device would be at room temperature, 300 Kelvin, uh, the hot end of the device, uh, the heat source temperature given here again in, uh, in Kelvin. And then there's the efficiency uh, plotted over here. And the top line, this one, is the Carnot efficiency, which is the thermodynamic uh, limit. And unfortunately, uh, when you look into this, there are uh, typical uh, bits of information. This one is in particular the uh, medium temperature, so the middle between the, uh, the hot and the cold, T bar. This is the cold temperature, 300 Kelvin. This is the hot temperature. And to, in fact, reach the Carnot efficiency, you would have to have this product out of the temperature and this prefactor which uh, has the units of 1 over temperature, uh, this has to be infinity. Uh, realistic uh, devices, uh, where realistic values for different materials are given here. So a typical material nowadays has a ZT of 0.7. In fact, the uh, uh, radioisotope thermal generators that I described to you work with silicon germanium. They have a ZT, uh, really state-of-the-art, complicated molecular beam epitaxy to fabricate this a little bit above 1.1. Uh, the holy grail currently is to reach, uh, reliably reach a ZT of 2. But you see already here that when you, when you achieve this what I just called the holy grail, you're still at a uh, temperature of 1000 K or so, you're still at a uh, reduction of the Carnot efficiency by roughly uh, 60%. So if you have the choice and you can afford to have some mechanical movement, it will always be better to in fact use some thermodynamic uh, process that you can indeed operate at the uh, uh, at the uh, Carnot efficiency limit. Um, there are other uh, values given here, like a ZT of 4 and 20. As I said, a ZT of 2 uh, at this stage is uh, uh, the important uh, bit of uh, um, goal. This Z, which is one of the two factors in this Z times temperature, uh, is given by the square of the Seebeck coefficient times the conductivity, the electronic conductivity, di divided by the thermal conductivity. Uh, and now we can have a look at what kind of materials should we use to optimize this uh, figure of merit Z. The uh, Seebeck coefficient is very high in semiconductor materials, in metals it's very low. So plotting this as a function of the typical con carrier concentration, 
uh, from 10 to the 18 degeneratively doped uh, semiconductors to 10 to the 21, 10 to the 22 per cubic centimeters for uh, metals, you see this drastic decrease in S. Therefore, you would prefer to have a uh, thermoelectric generator fabricated from a semiconductor. Unfortunately, a uh, semiconductor does conduct electricity badly, as the name says, so therefore you will have a lot of internal resistance in this device and you want to uh, reduce this internal resistance. This you can do by increasing the carrier concentration. Um, as you plot it here, this increases the conductivity uh, Z and therefore you can find an optimum value of roughly of the order of at 10 to the 20 per cubic centimeters for the carrier concentration at which this so-called power factor peaks. However, you also have to take into account the thermal conductivity. And the thermal conductivity at high concentrations is simply given uh, by the uh, thermal conductivity of the electrons. So the K will be proportional to the sigma and at very low um, uh, carrier concentrations, this thermal conductivity is dominated by the phononic uh, contribution. Therefore, plugging all of this together, you find that the Z has a maximum, again, in the range of uh, degeneratively doped semiconductors, a little bit above uh, the degeneration point. The state of the art uh, for n-type materials, now plotting this z times the temperature, in fact the medium temperature, uh, you see is for silicon germanium this value of 1, 1.1. 1 .1. When you want to go to low temperatures, you need to use very heavy and uh, in some cases not uh, very nice uh, elements for uh, the environment uh, to realize such a thermoelectric generator. P-type material is given over here, again, silicon germanium, lead telluride, and some other um, uh, compounds out of lead and timony, again, mostly very heavy uh, elements. There's very, very little you can do to uh, optimize the um, Seebeck uh, coefficient, and there's very little that you can do to optimize the conductivity. There are a few stuff that you can do, but little. So mostly uh, what people optimize is a reduction of the phononic contribution to the thermal conductivity. And you can do this, for example, in uh, these different uh, chemical structures, clephrides or scutorudides, uh, where you have this kind of cage-like um, um, structures in uh, crystalline material and then in these cages there are uh, atoms, uh, very heavy atoms that are comparatively free to move around. Uh, these devices are called rattlers. So you have a, a phonon uh, coming through this material and there is a little uh, atom that can be uh, excited very comparatively easily to, uh, to move around and to scatter phonons. A different approach are either disordered structures or structures which a, with a very complex uh, unit cell, uh, such as those, or uh, the uh, introduction of inclusions, like in this material, which is lead, antimony, silver, telluride where in this TEM picture you can see this. However, in the uh, uh, material system dear to at least my heart, silicon and germanium, uh, approaches that have been discussed in the literature are, for example, phonon mismatch. So imagine a uh, super lattice out of silicon and germanium uh, uh, layers um, the, this is the phonon density of states as a function of the frequency and you see the very noticeably different uh, uh, LO phonon uh, lines of, uh, of silicon and of germanium and if you try to transport some phonons of this energy they obviously will be reflected once they uh, try to enter into germanium. 
The second approach is uh, alloy scattering, where on a uh, atomic scale we bring in disorder, uh, and you can here see the thermal conductivity of uh, pure silicon and pure germanium, and you uh, see that by an introduction of um, an alloy with roughly 50% of silicon or 50% of germanium, you reduce this uh, uh, phonon conductivity by roughly a factor of 20. A further possibility is uh, surface roughening. These are uh, nano wires. And you can see that uh, the, the surface of these nano wires can be uh, made uh, pretty rough, such that a phonon conductivity along this wire would be hindered by this roughness. And the uh, fourth uh, process or device structure uh, suggested in literature is uh, so called holy silicon. In this, uh, what you should look at here is uh, the, uh, the, the particular holes which are brought into the system. And therefore, uh, we have uh, for phonons with uh, long wavelengths a lot of, uh, of scattering going on. And what interests me is can we combine these uh, uh, different approaches in a single kind of uh, film uh, which and then study how the uh, thermal conductivity looks uh, like in these materials. Uh, and we do, we fabricate these uh, thin films starting from nanoparticles, which we get from a uh, collaborator in, uh, at the University of uh, Duisburg, Essen. Uh, these are particles grown in a microwave plasma. And I think you can uh, see at least the Moiré pattern uh, that shows you that the core of this 20 nanometer uh, diameter uh, silicon nanoparticle is indeed uh, crystalline. And uh, then around you see this disordered shell uh, and using electron uh, energy loss spectroscopy we can see that this outer shell is indeed a silicon dioxide shell while in the inside we have uh, as good as we can uh, conclude this pure silicon. We take these particles and these collaborators can make, if they want kilograms of these particles per day, we make an ink out of this uh, by uh, dispersing these nanoparticles in ethanol. Then based from this ink we use a spinner to make a thin film of these nanoparticles, evaporate the ethanol, and then we still have to remove this oxide shell because that will, in most applications, hinder us. And we do this by exposing the thin film formed to an atmosphere containing hydrofluoric acid. And we then take this film and go into our laser lab, position it inside a uh, vacuum system, have a neodymium laser, a pulsed laser operating, bring the laser beam on top of the sample sitting inside the vacuum. Uh, we use a pulsed uh, system, uh, which unfortunately this laser is too, uh, too good in its uh, proper uh, quality, so therefore we see these kind of interference fringes and to make sure that uh, uh, these don't um, negatively influence our thin films, we uh, move the sample underneath the, uh, these pu laser pu pulses to uh, basically homogenize the uh, uh, layer shown. The result of this are structures, thin film structures, which look very similar to uh, the holy uh, silicon uh, that I've shown you a moment ago. Uh, you see these meander-like uh, features. Underneath there are some particles, some silicon particles, which have uh, not been uh, incorporated into this meander-like structure. And uh, in each of these cases there has been, as far as I remember, a total of 10 pulses with an increasing fluence of the photons from very little to a lot. And you can see that the typical structure size increases with the fluence of uh, the laser beam. In fact, we can uh, quantify this 
with, uh, with a little statistics, looking, for example, at the neck size in these structures, so basically this kind of necks, do statistics in this uh, diagram, uh, and plot this size as a function of affluence. You can see that this has a more or less linear dependence on the laser power, but the conductivity starts from somewhere near zero, and then at around uh, 40 millijoule per square centimeter, a plateau is reached until we go to very, very high fluences where the meander-like structure apparently co loses connectivity. So there's a, a regime where the effective conductivity through this nanostructure thin film is independent of the fluence while we still have a large, very much changing uh, uh, structure size. To make use of this for thermoelectric applications, we certainly have to look into the charge transport. Uh, we know that the effective conductivity of these samples is about a tenth of what we would expect when we would have a silicon of the same macroscopic uh, dimension, but uh, where we would not have this meanders. Uh, and we can understand this quantitatively, again, with the help of a colleague in uh, Duisburg, Professor Wolf, by taking a scanning electron microscope from our very samples generated, process this a little bit, uh, just making the contrast very, very hard, and then we find regions where uh, we, we assume to have a conductivity such as these white regions and then black regions where we have no conductivity at all. And we give these structures to the colleagues who then calculate a current or current density as one would expect it for a macroscopic contact on top and a macroscopic uh, ground contact on the bottom. And you see this uh, very complicated uh, uh, current structure uh, going through, and in particular you can then calculate the average conductivity and within a very small error bar we find indeed this same factor of 10 from theory as we have seen it in experiment. How can we uh, dope this material? Typically uh, doping is achieved by introducing uh, generally toxic gases into the uh, microwave plasma generating these silicon nanoparticles. So we generate these particles by silane or germane um, plasmas. Uh, both silane and germane are also gases that have to be, uh, well, you have to take a lot of care when you want to use them, but for doping you would have to introduce phosphine, arsine, diborane, which are definitely even more dangerous than uh, silane. So an approach, to find an approach where we could get around this gaseous doping of these nanoparticles would be a very important. And indeed we found one sketched here where we start with these silicon nanoparticles. We immerse them in a solution containing dopant atoms and this, I, I'll go through it in a minute. Uh, this works with uh, nearly everything we have tried. We let this uh, uh, dry so that uh, pictorially we have these uh, dopant atoms attached uh, to the outside of these silicon nanoparticles. And then we perform a light, the laser sintering process to have both the meander-like structure formed as well as to have the um, dopants electrically active. And uh, we then uh, devised a picture like this where we vary the dopant concentration in the solution, so this blue in here, and we measure in blue the electrical conductivity as the, well as in, uh, in red the thermal voltage. And this particular example is how we, uh, where we looked at this for the very first time, which is arsenic in germanium, germanium by itself is p-type uh, from the thermal voltage by, uh, at low uh, doping concentrations. And then bringing in uh, arsine, there's a certain uh, limit uh, where we have uh, uh, full compensation of the um, uh, p-type 
effective p-type doping in the germanium, which is probably caused by um, a germanium dangling bond states. And then suddenly at this concentration, the um, thermal voltage uh, switches from positive for p-type to negative for n-type. And at the same time, the conductivity shows this uh, drastic uh, increase. We can now go, now go through all the different dopants, phosphorus, arsenic, bis, uh, antimony, bismuth, uh, in germanium. You always see the same kind of behavior. P-type to begin with changes to N-type. Uh, gallium and indium, same uh, thing we see with increasing uh, doping concentration of gallium and indium and decrease in the thermal voltage as well as an increase in the conductivity. However, for boron and aluminum, we have failed until now. So in germanium, at least these six dopants work. You can now do the same analysis for silicon germanium compound materials, uh, in particular also elemental silicon. And the summary of this is that uh, indeed, apart from aluminum, all these dopants uh, work. Uh, and we have looked into uh, the process that is going on. Uh, it's sketched again here with a deposited film, the immersion, then these particular dopant atoms probably specifically absorb uh, on these surfaces. We let this evaporate and then uh, hopefully have a dilute incorporation forming active dopants uh, and obviously uh, segregation on the surface or clustering inside is not a good idea. And you, can, you see that uh, the students had a lot of uh, uh, fun um, doing a set of very, very systematic experiments varying the temperature, uh, the uh, duration of this uh, immersion time, varying the ionic strength in the solvent, varying the pH. And uh, by all doing all this very carefully, our current conclusion is that we have a specific adsorption on the surface going on. Uh, final three slides. Um, when you want to use such a device for um, thermoelectric applications, measuring the Seebeck effect is extremely easy. Measuring the conductivity is comparatively easy. And for a thin film, measuring the thermal conductivity is hell. It's really, really difficult. Uh, and uh, the, mostly the reason is that because this is a thin film, uh, you have this uh, supported by a substrate. You can choose an insulating substrate, which has no uh, electrical conductivity to talk about. Perfect but it will always have a little bit of a thermal conductivity. And in particular, typically a substrate is a lot thicker than the thin film that you deposit on this. So even if the thermal conductivity is really low, the thermal conductance can still be very high. Therefore, uh, we uh, like to do these kinds of experiments for thermal conductivity measurements with a Raman type of device. Uh, we take our thin layer lift it off our substrate material, which by itself is not very easy, deposit it on a different carrier, such as a crystalline germanium carrier, kind of solder it to this carrier to have a heat bath at the edges of the structure. Then we use a laser to locally heat this uh, uh, thin film and then we measure the local temperature at the po position of the laser heating with the help of the Raman effect. In particular, here is shown the uh, shift of the, uh, the Raman shift of the light, which is uh, reflected from uh, this uh, thin film of silicon in this particular case. And you see when you come in with a low laser intensity and you have uh, no heating, you have the uh, uh, Raman laser position characteristic for the um, material at low temperatures. But when you, when you increase the laser power, you deposit more power, you heat up 
this uh, region where the laser hits the sample and therefore you, uh, you soften the lattice and the softening of the lattice uh, you can observe by a downshift of the LO phonon peak in the Raman. This is uh, very well known for bulk uh, silicon uh, as plotted here. The, we found at least seven uh, different publications and there's this uh, nice uh, color um, overview done by uh, Simon on all the different uh, data available and out of this we made kind of our internal reference uh, um, data which allow us to measure the Raman shift and then look up for a certain Raman shift. Well, obviously we have this particular temperature at the, uh, at the point of our illumination. And we then, fortunately or unfortunately, still have to do a little bit of simulation. The simulation is that we have the self-supporting thin layer, uh, which has a typical in-plane thermal conductivity kappa and then this layer sits on top of the substrate and we have a thermal contact resistance to the substrate. And uh, you can then, for a certain laser power, come up with diagrams like this, where we plot the average spot temperature as determined by this Raman experiment as a function of the position of the beam in this uh, window uh, of uh, material and you see here a, uh, a simulated plot for a high thermal conductivity and a high uh, resistance to the substrate and uh, in this case both uh, are low and uh, to now find out the um, um, properties of these thin layers this is one of these um, uh, laser annealed uh, layers with the meander structures uh, on this germanium uh, wafer, there is uh, the, the, the soldering, which is done by a, a colleague of ours, Sonja Mattig, with the help of the focused ion beam uh, system. Uh, and you can then use this device, measure it. Uh, apparently, in this upper corner, the uh, contact resistance was a lot larger. There, in fact, was not, not such a good contact to the substrate. You can then take such a measurement data, plug this into your simulation, get a simulation out, compare this, and in kind of a self-consistent loop, find out typical values of uh, the thermal conductivity. So the big positive aspect uh, where we want to go, and this is a project which we started about three years ago, and uh, we don't have a final answer on how high a ZT we can reach because we still have about two years to go. But the big hope of this project is summarized in this uh, final uh, slide uh, where we have uh, phonon uh, scattering by alloy as, uh, by different atoms sitting on an alloy. So therefore we can have very high energy uh, phonons with a short wavelength scattered. We can still have inclusions of our silicon or germanium nanoparticles in there such that we can scatter um, wavelengths which are a little uh, longer, phonons which are a little uh, lower in energy. Uh, then uh, we have um, uh, these um, uh, microscopic uh, regions where the laser annealing has uh, worked decently. So of a typical range of 100 nanometers, this was about 10 nanometers. This is uh, about uh, several angstroms. And then due to the meander structure, uh, we could also hope to effectively scatter very, very long uh, wavelength. So finally, I went through, uh, I, I summarized uh, with you uh, the uh, physics and applications of thermoelectrics. We talked about optimizing this by optimizing the Z uh, and uh, the only real free parameter to reach this uh, optimization is to uh, vary the uh, microstructure to uh, decrease the um, thermal conductivity. I've uh, described to you these meander-like structures generated via laser annealing. 
this uh, doping uh, that we developed as well as uh, the, our approach in measuring the thermal conductivity. Thank you very much.